I want to get right into this thing, man. What is your channel all about? Spiritual Nomad and really anything else you want to give us? What is this all about? Your work here, you know? Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, Gary, thanks for reaching out and setting this all up. And uh, as we were just talking a little bit beforehand, it's just incredible. The internet connecting people from all over the world. It's, it's connected me like you're in Boston, I'm in San Diego. And it's like, now I have friends from all over the place, mm -hmm. all because I post videos on this channel, Spiritual Nomad, and started this podcast, you know? Yeah. And um, I started the channel years ago it was first just a podcast and um we can kind of get more maybe into some of the the story of it or whatever but um i started that channel the name of it came because i was originally a church planter with a christian uh, organization and um i moved to san diego from indianapolis and i was going through a whole like deconstruction of my faith just kind of taking everything apart from what i was told when i was supposed to believe yeah. as a pastor's kid and uh, am a pastor's kid. And whenever I was meeting with somebody who was like an overseer for my region, they were asking me the very evangelical question of who are you reaching? You know, what people group are you evangelizing to essentially? And I started to tell them about this thing of like spiritual nomads. That's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to people who are not really involved in religion or spirituality, but they do kind of have a spirituality. They seem connected to God in some way, but not in a formal sense. Yeah. Um, more maybe agnostic or universalist-minded people. And uh, I was articulating that those are my people that I'm reaching. When really, and this is where the shadow self, if you're into Carl Jung or anything like that, is like I was actually just describing to this authority figure my reality, what I was going through. I felt like I was disconnecting from my tradition. I felt like I was going into a no man's land without having any sort of like path to follow at that point. And uh, really just articulating my own journey subconsciously, unconsciously. I don't know how you'd put that. And so basically um, that phrase stuck with me. And whenever I had that revelation that that was me and the church plant uh, didn't really happen, uh, it started to, we we let it go because it just didn't feel right to us. Uh, I started the podcast in uh, January of 2017, and it wasn't really anything super formal or big. It was just me with this mic that I got on offer up for 50 bucks sitting in my uh, bedroom. I have a wife and two kids. So like whenever they'd be out at the playground or something, and I would just kind of open journal style, talk about where I was at, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, being a spiritual nomad myself. So that's kind of the the premise of the name and and has really stuck through the content for for what I do with that channel. Awesome, man. So how did you start to see Christianity differently? Where did this all come from for you to see Jesus and what he taught a little bit differently and stray away from the dogma? Yeah. Man, it started for me, um, if you want to go way back, probably a decade ago. Uh, do you have, a, by the way, do you have a background with Christianity or, or what, what's kind of your story with that? No, I mean, I was never involved with any formal Christian group. I never went to church. First time I went to church was uh, two years ago with my girlfriend on Christmas Eve. And I was like, really? Oh, what was that like? Not that I will tell you about where where it all broke down for me, but I'm curious. Oh, it's just a little strange. I would also like to preface. I went there on some cannabis edibles, so I was fully involved. <laughs> you already took the sacraments before you exactly, went. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, I took the sacrament before I went, and uh, it just was like it was strange, and without any understanding, you know, any upbringing, just analyzing it from. An outside point of view, it seemed like a ceremony and a cult revolving around the psychedelic use because it all led up to the eating of the Eucharist. So I'm like, well, all this would make a lot more sense. Everything that they just said, if at the end of it, they took some mushrooms or they ate some cannabis edibles. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like this the flesh of the gods. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, this seems like a very shallow representation of what they used to do thousands of years ago. And that's why it has become dogma. 
quite potentially that's yeah. my own theory is that because they strayed away really from the roots and where it all came from and they don't take the mushrooms anymore <laughs> right Maybe, that's just my theory i don't know yeah dude no i think there's a fair theory for that um there's a lot of different theories and i think that's one thing that um has been fun over the years is like whether jesus was a mushroom or was he was you know a construction of ideas of roman empires or or whatever you know um mm. after all of my wanderings nomading around i've i've come back around to uh not dogma but the the notion that jesus was a historical figure um who was a fully realized being who you know the western greco-roman world didn't know what to do with someone who knew their true nature yeah you know <laughs> and uh you know confronted the powers that be both religiously and politically and therefore you know whenever somebody is getting out of hand the best way to handle them is to, to get them out of the picture you know so they nailed them to the cross thing and they kind of put a stop to the thing not realizing that it would only just catapult it to 2000 years later we're still you know mm -hmm. talking about it mm -hmm. and even christians will say the cross is the the thing i would disagree with them on that but um that was definitely Paul's idea that it was the thing, but uh, in Hebrews, whatever. But the point is, is that like, you know, this guy who knew who he was and came to share this teaching, we have kind of made a, to your point, a cult around him, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> that's not what the, the teachings were at all. Yeah. You know, the, the teachings were here to help you understand and realize who you are, your connection to what he calls the Father, Abba, which was an intimate language for the divine. He never used Yahweh once. People assume that the, the Hebrew name attributed to God. Jesus doesn't even use that, that name for God once. He says, Father, intimate language, oneness language. And um, But yeah, we've made a whole cult around him and essentially singing birthday songs with group karaoke <laughs> every Sunday at church yeah. and think he's down with that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's a very weird thing uh, that that's come up. You're right, though. It's it's just a, a a bunch of Jesus cults. Not necessarily saying that's always bad, but yeah, they're <laughs> missing a few things. Potentially the main sacrament. You know, exactly. I was joking around. We had uh, uh, we have a, a church community. We're trying to reimagine what church could be, and we we're having a, a beach fire, and because uh, not many churches or, or ministers would, you know. Uh, advocate for psychedelics i mean it's not for everybody but certain people it could help um and we were joking about you know if somebody came in and wanted to learn about god i could just say well you want to meet him you know what i mean <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we we i mean we got <laughs> access if you want to meet the guy you know but uh anyway i'm, I'm kind of joking halfway not but but mostly i'm um but yeah, man, and thanks for sharing your your story about that because I'm always fascinated people that want to have conversation with me. They're usually, uh, you know, of a background of Christianity and they're resonating with a more expanded understanding of what the Christ is. And so it's always cool whenever even someone like yourself, like, I don't know, two years ago, I just dropped in with my girlfriend, you know, so. I want to see what um, it was like. Yeah. I love your takeaway. <laughs> yeah exactly it's kind of what i expected but actually being in it i'm like yeah definitely this is a call for sure <laughs> they're missing yeah, the point stoned helped see that too for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was definitely a psychedelic experience in a strange way but yeah help open my oh, eyes. mind manifesting yeah yeah so how did you start to see jesus differently though like how how did this come about for you because you've been exposed to it since birth, probably. When did it start to click for you that, hey, this isn't right here. The, the, what Jesus is saying isn't how people are actually living. You know, they're mm -hmm. kind of misconstruing the word. So how did you come to see this? You know, what, what sparked it for you? Uh, I think just being curious. Mm -hmm. I think that, that curiosity and anybody who has any bit of artistic nature in them um will quickly see through the the equation of dogma you know yeah if we can sum up the infinite with this plus this equals this which in our my christianity would be like the nicene creed and all of the 
the the the doctrines that we have around you know our own cosmology and Christology. It's like the infinite cannot be summed up by finite beings. Yeah. That's just mm -hmm. you know. So I guess just in the beginning it was curiosity, um, and podcasts actually helped out which oh, yeah. a lot of pastors today are like vocally speaking against like podcasting and things. And I'm like, that's exactly what was happening in the early church. Everybody yep. had their own versions of Christianity and, and the Orthodox people come through and start burning books. And it's like information, knowledge is powerful, you know, mm -hmm. it's transformative. Um, so the minute people start to try to throttle that, you should probably start <laughs> pressing into these things a little more, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. That's the big difference between dogma and real spirituality is curiosity. Yes, curiosity and openness, uh, yeah. which didn't come naturally at first. I'm a pastor's kid, you know, and um, I think that, you know, my, my conditioning is something I've had to work through over these years. But the first thing that, that really sort of un started to unravel things, and a lot of people that come from my tradition of Christianity, this is a big one that helps them begin to see God in a different way, the divine, more accurate language, the divine in a different way, is this idea of hell that so many Christians have been indoctrinated with, that there is some everlasting place that is people are going to be tormented for eternity without end, you know, uh, for things that they did or didn't do, you know, like in a very evangelical Christian setting where I grew up, you know, like if you're or smoking cigarettes or, you know, sleeping with your girlfriend at 15 or whatever, all of a sudden God just has to lock you away in some fiery dungeon for all of eternity mm -hmm. because, you know, you're acting on the instincts that God gave you. Uh, but I digress. Um, maybe not the cigarette part, but certainly the sex part, you know, it's <laughs> like, yeah, you're a teenager. What the hell did you expect? Mm -hmm. I'm wired for this, you know, but, yeah. uh, Anyway, like hell was a, um, a a big one for me, doctrine that a lot of evangelicals still hold to that like whenever I would read the sort of like slam dunk verses in the Bible about that, like when I was in Bible school and, and, and teaching and things, I remember consciously preparing for a message one time and thinking, I, in my intuition, my true self, I didn't have that language then, but looking back, you know, I don't see what I'm supposed to see here. Mm -hmm. And I remember having to make the conscious decision to see what my tradition tells me I should see. Yeah. And that always stuck with me because it always felt disingenuous. It felt like I, I can't actually have an, an own original intuitive spiritual idea about something. And it wasn't even really looking back, it's like, yeah, I was just holding up my own indoctrination, you know, but that sparked me into reading other authors that, you know, I won't bore you with too many of the years of details, but um, through that process, I, I became open revisiting old authors, authors like Rob Bell, which is a very buzzword name from the tradition I come from. Um, he questioned that idea too. And then very shortly within a few years of time, I uh, was a guy named Richard Rohr. He's a Franciscan uh, father, but he uh, really opened the door to mystics, the Christian mystics, and um, opened me up to Buddhism and Hinduism, showing more similarities and commonalities, not differences. Yeah. And in my tradition, it was always about what separates us. And in his philosophy, it's, well, what unifies us? Mm -hmm. Then I got into Alan Watts and Ram Dass and Krishnamurti and you know it, it's just kind of a open door from there and and really considered um uh, you know being uh pursuing more of a path maybe in Zen Buddhism or something but um have revisited this Jesus path for some important reasons but um yeah that's that's kind of what started this whole thing was hell and then the mystics and yeah seeing where we're connected yeah. more than we're divided, you know? Yeah, that's powerful. I think that's very important in today's world where we have people like you that are articulate and charismatic that provide a solid reinterpretation of really what Jesus was trying to tell us because there's still so much dogma. There's still so many people that are drinking the Kool-Aid. 
And to me, yeah. I'm like, don't you see it? Isn't that intuitive sense going off in you? Like it went off in you where it said like, yeah, hey, something's not right here. Right. Yeah. It's just lazy. It's lazy spiritualism. They just say, give yourself to Jesus and he'll take care of the rest. And that's it. That's all you got to do. Go to church on Sunday and that's it. I'm like, I don't know. That's just like, it doesn't compute for me. And I don't know how it doesn't compute for other people. Maybe eventually we'll get there. But point is, I think it's very important for people like you to speak up about this and be a, a real Christian because the, all those people that say they're Christians, they're not really Christians. <laughs> You're fake right. Christians. And Jesus yeah. would laugh at you. He would, I don't know if he'd shun you, but he would just be like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> it's kind of a shame yeah. you know it's kind of a yeah, shame yeah but so yeah what i'm saying is it's awesome what you're doing and other people like you that are given a different viewpoint and synopsis of jesus's teachings yeah yeah not that and it doesn't come without people uh you know kicking against that i got oh. some i get some massive hate yeah you know? i get that anytime i say god all you gotta do is just say god i've come to realize like I'm not going to say God anymore because that's like a, the most weighted word probably in all languages. If you say God and you have a different interpretation of God than somebody else, if it's not Jesus, then they're going to come at you. They're going to crucify you. <laughs> Dude, they, so they do. Just they say do. the divine. I think you said before the divine or the universe or other terms that would be a little bit more digestible. But if you say the big G word, get ready for people just, uh, <laughs> rampaging on you in the comments <laughs> oh dude i know it I, it's funny you bring that up because i actually just talked about that at our uh service on sunday um and advocating for the use of the language of god because like taking it back yeah like it, and people don't even know what that word means you know and uh, yeah. i actually just uploaded um for the first time ever that my talk from sunday at the at the service and um people don't even know what that word means like where does that word even come from it's we yeah, right. when we say the word we we're we're saying a a heavy weighted baggage story every time we use that word that everybody seems to have a different relationship with mm. and so it's like one word is a sign and a signal for all of these different narratives yeah and that's why it's so hard yeah. you know mm -hmm. so universe is fine um i I kind of joke about like, you know, uh, studying more like the multiverse. Now I'm like, universe feels limited to me. I don't want to use, I don't want the, the one reality. I, yeah. I want, I want the many different mm -hmm. versions, you know, so open to them at least. So it's many different labels, many different narratives. None yeah. of them truly add up really. Right. I mean, how would we define God? I would say it's, a word that we use almost as a placeholder for what we cannot truly describe. Right? Yeah. But then when you put something into it, like God is just Jesus and that's it. That's when you get the tirade in the comments. <laughs> totally. <laughs> right? Totally. Well, and, and Jesus never once claimed that he was God. And any time that, that people tried to attribute that to him, he always would, would shy away from that. They'd say, good teacher. And he'd say, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. He always pointed up to the Father. When people tried to look to him, cling to him, attach to him, it was always busted up and, and to look, mm -hmm. look heavenly, which yeah. heaven just means unseen. Uh, it actually literally means the sky above. It doesn't mean some place where, you know, cupids are, you know, playing harps and weird stuff. You know, like yeah. it's it's heaven and earth is the seen and the unseen, the spiritual and the physical. That's that's all those things are. He always pointed heavenly yeah. whenever people tried to attach to his earthly body. Mm -hmm. um, and even you say, God, like I love in the Tao, it says, you know, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I like, I was listening to uh, this guy, James Finley. He's a great teacher. And he says, you know, in the same way, uh, Lao Tzu says, for lack of a better name, I call it the Tao. And so in our tradition, we say, for lack of a better name, we call it God, you know? Yeah, that's good. Um, so that's that's kind of my approach with it. Yeah, well, that's really good. It's just uh, many fingers pointing at the yep. same moon. <laughs> that's it. That's it, man. <laughs> yeah. And what Christianity in the modern sense has become is just a giant 
mistake for what Jesus was really trying to say, mistaking the finger for the moon, you know? Yes. And not even just Jesus. That's the thing is, as you've come to find the truth is one and the wise call it by many names. And all yeah. the sages are saying the same thing. It's give mm -hmm. glory to the ineffable, ineffable. I don't know why I can't say that word. Give glory to God. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. ironic. I can't say ineffable, right? <laughs> that's hey, that's some symbolism. Dude. That's some symbolism right there. I love it. I love it. And you know, I do think there is like um for us Westerners, there's a unique relationship that we do have with Jesus. Um, and and to confront that narrative is to confront hundreds, thousands of years of the mainline story, you know. And I think that um at this point in time, i I shy away from from the confrontation, a lot of points in times, but I know I'm okay with it now. I'm pressing into it more, whatever. Um, you know, some people might hate me for this, but you know, I, I like astrology in my chart. My midheaven is an Aries, so I know wherever I'm going is going to be the ram horn of confrontation. So it's like, well, that's just kind of the name of the game, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just kind of bucking through with with some of this at this point, even with all the hate texts and things that I've gotten quite recently you know, heretic hunters and stuff, whatever. Heretic hunters. <laughs> um, I do. They're out there and they're, they're feisty. Oh yeah. Um, which I could speak to that as well, but, but really whenever I, I, I think there's something unique in Jesus that, that needs revisited. You say, um, sorry, you broke up. There's something unique in Jesus. Yeah. There's something unique in Jesus that needs revisited specifically for Westerners. Yeah. Um, because at least for me, it was way easier to go on rabbit trails, you know, about Krishna or Siddhartha Gautama, you know, the Buddha, or it, because it was not my, you know, cultural tradition, religion, mm -hmm. you know, and for many of us in, in the United States, I mean, for all of us, we have some relationship to this image or figure. We at least know who he is and we have... There's a reason stand-up comedians can make all sorts of jokes about God or Jesus, whatever, and everybody laughs because we all get it, mm -hmm. you know, just where we're at. Yeah. So I think like revisiting this unique figure for us specifically and really for the world due to colonization and things like that is to show that this incarnation um, was special mm -hmm. and shouldn't be disregarded. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, felt like I needed dis to discard it because of my baggage with it. Mm. And what I'm hoping to show people is when we understand Jesus in his own nature and not from all of the other extra writings about him, yeah. but when we begin with the Gospels or even the Gospel of Thomas, got a version here, if you guys ever want to check it out, you know, Gospel of Thomas, we could riff on that in a little bit. Mm -hmm which should have been in the Bible, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, so when you, when you listen to Jesus first and allow his words to speak first before you listen to Paul's epistles or James, who they say is Jesus' brother, or you start with the idea of revelation that the world's coming to an end, or you start with the idea of some you know, Jewish Messiah that's going to come and do all... Like, when you just listen to the master's words first and then filter everything from that, mm. I think that we'll see a much more clear picture of what this master was intending for his students yeah. um, that would go even beyond the first century to today. And what that that is, is a deep realization of, of a few things. One is that that you and the father would be one. That's Jesus' pinnacle prayer in John 17. And that you would have a realization of what Jesus refers to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says that the kingdom of God is within you. And so this kingdom is a rule or reign of divinity. And so there seems to be a dimension of reality that is here available, always eternal now, that you can step into, become aware of, shift consciousness into, to kingdom consciousness that's not of this world, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, that is a different plane or frequency of being that enables all sorts of 
cool metaphysical things in Jesus' ways or just a different posture of heart of living in union and flow with the Tao, with God, um, that he is giving that as a gift to people, that there is an option to live in an alternative way to what we've been handed in this of reality. And so I'd say like seeing that being the core fundamental of Jesus' message um, radically changes the, the evangelical mainstream, mainline, charismatic Christian church idea, you know? And so that's really kind of the the summary of what I want to do to help people see is that the kingdom is a, is available for a consciousness to live into, you know? Mm. So kind of a tangent there, but <laughs> no, that's, that's, very that's well where said. I'm at. That's, uh, that's where I'm at too. I feel that man. That was very well said. I have so many things that I want to go into. I got to like focus in on one, <laughs> so, one thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm done. We'll jump into any of it. This is a conversation. I start getting on my, well, there's you know. one part of me that is saying, all right, so we've already talked about Jesus a little too much, but I think this is good because it's a unique conversation. It needs to be said, but then there's another part of me that wants to like kind of stray away from it so i'm like who do i listen to here but i want to jesus is, <laughs> jesus is uh talking to me he's speaking so i want to go more into jesus do you believe that he uh is a superior sage and teacher or master than all of the other sages like you said there's something very special about the incarnation of jesus christ so do you believe that he is the one still like do you still hold him in reverence as the one the one teacher for the west or the world altogether um you know what i'm getting at like the truth is one, i do yeah, yeah but he's the best <laughs> i think that uh and i'll be brief on this that way we can save time for the other fun stuff mm -hmm. but um the the shortest way i could say that is i can only speak for me mm. uh each of us can only speak for ourselves. Mm -hmm. The minute that we start to get into the realm of he's the best for me and should be for you too. Yeah. yeah. You know, and if he's not for you too, then we're going to, da, 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 you know, whatever. Um, again, I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in all of this. What brought me back to it is that left to my own devices through all of my reading, all of my meditation, all of my psychedelic experiences the the language in the that that comes to me whenever i use language like holy spirit or whenever i think about the 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 person and the life of christ it does elevate something different within me cuz that's how i've been conditioned and wired yeah um so for me i love i love buddhism i love gautama siddhartha i think his teaching i think the eightfold path is is a you should live that way, you know? Um, I think the Four Noble Truths are where it's at. I think that I always come back to Krishna's on, on conversation with Arjuna and the, before the battle begins, you know, and he sees people he loves on both sides and Krishna tells him he must do his do. Like there are stories that, that move me and that I come back to. So in that way, for me, um, he's extremely special. And why I say for the West is because we all have this familiarity with this figure mm. um so what it, it seems to me like um people are the most divided about this spiritual teacher because it comes with all that conditioning for each of us that it's probably something like what i feel too you know mm -hmm. um so i said i was going to be short about this and now here i am again good. talking to you all day about it but um to say that he is the way he says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is the one Father source reality, but we have to remember who he's talking to. He's talking to people who are the religious elite, who are safeguarding and preventing people. And whenever he says that he is the way, he's talking about his way of being, the way of living, yeah. the kingdom consciousness. He's not talking about you articulating very specific dogmatic beliefs to a priest somewhere while he's doing rites and rituals, and now your name is in the book of life because they literally put you in the church registration. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, it's a way more spiritual embodiment. Uh, the last will be first and the first will be last. 
you know, so the people that think they get it are probably the ones that don't. So his way is, is not the way of the Pharisee, not the way of the religious, not the way of the gatekeeper. Um, that's the way, the truth and the life, yeah. the secret way, the, the hidden way, way within. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Esoteric way. So that's yeah. good. He's the right way for, for me in a lot of ways, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm not here to, to proselytize. Mm hmm. I get that. Neither was he. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter if he is the one as a personified figure. The way is the way is the way. And the way can take many different shapes and sizes and forms and yes. labels. But it is it is the way. And I think that is the important teaching of Jesus. Is like, I don't know. It's like on one hand you revere him, but on the other hand you have to see past that into really what he was trying to say so it's like it's both it's almost like you have to revere him as a wonderful teacher maybe the teacher who knows maybe for some yes for others maybe not but it doesn't matter that's the thing at the same time he may be the teacher but what he is teaching is to not revere him really so much as the teacher is like find your own teacher within right it's this uh it's this simultaneous paradox of reverence for him because the reverence is supposed to be for him and then ultimately turn that around for a reverence inside of you right that's all we would want yes. and i think that's all any guru or teacher really wants or represents is yourself <laughs> any valid teaching is for you to just come back to you that is the way i believe so that's it yeah yeah i get that man that's pretty powerful stuff um oh, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Praise Jesus. So how do we start to see this in our life, would you say? Would you recommend meditation? Maybe a little bit of sacrament use? Uh yeah, I don't know. What do you recommend for people to just simply be able to um have this dawn, this revelation, this seeing in one's life? Hmm. I think for me and, and what I always recommend to everyone is, is like you said, I mean, the most simple fundamental truth in all spirituality is meditation, um, contemplation. Still. That's it. Like if you begin to still the mind, slow down, um, like I always tell people, again, in my tradition, we talk about um, the spirit being a still small voice to hear God is the still small voice. And I think if you're going to hear a still small voice, you better be turning everything down, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and slowing down to do that. And that doesn't mean that you can't still, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a husband and a dad. I, I got a busy life stuff going on. That doesn't, it's about that inner space of stillness. Um, but I think for people, uh, another way, especially in, in our culture, even kind of dovetailing on what we've been talking about is it's so tempting for us to want to uh, grasp concepts and ideas as being the knowledge. And, and I love the Gnostics and Christians have a wrong view about the Gnostics that this word gnosis means knowing and, and they Christians make you think that it's just about this hidden knowledge in terms of like book knowledge, but it's a hidden knowing within you. It's a, it's a capital K knowing mm. it's when, you know, Carl Jung was asked, do you believe in God? And he says, I don't need to believe. I know that's gnosis. That's yeah. wisdom. Uh, that's what Jesus was talking about and everything. So all of the meditation, all these things should bring you down into the, into the core of seed of truth within you. Uh, the enlightenment that's within you, the light that is there. And um, my encouragement for people is to always try to get beneath their preference and I aversions about their concepts and their ideas about who they are, what they believe in. Even consciousness becomes a conversation where it's it becomes pretty, um, you know, uh, inside baseball very quickly, you know? And it's like, I come back to, Jesus of the childlike faith or the Buddha talking about the beginner's mind. And if you want to, you know, be the, the most 
no knowledgeable and all this that's fine but uh at the end of the day what we're really after is to be free yeah every teacher is is encouraging you to be free um and the only person that holds the keys is you mm -hmm. is, is that soul inside of you um and so i think people when they begin to tap into that and, and practically dude like it's like intuition mm -hmm. like starting to practice your intuition just a little bit more. Honestly, starting to drop in with your feelings a little bit more. We've like bastardized our feelings, especially in Christianity for some reason, but even just in the Western world, we've idolized the mind. Mm -hmm. And we've cut off connection to the heart. The mind is great for things like this and conversation, but if it does not provide passage to the heart, it's frankly pointless yeah um and the only way people are getting free is through that when people become too intellectual they come fucking assholes <laughs> frankly yeah you know uh -huh. like my hope for my life and everybody else is that we're more compassionate yeah. we're more loving we're more gentle with ourself mm -hmm. forgiving of ourself therefore forgiving of our world forgiving of people around us mm -hmm. um and you mentioned about compounds or anything like that mm -hmm. like I don't always recommend uh, psychedelics or anything like that. I think for some people, though, because my wife and I have this conversation, because I, I don't think that it's, uh, we've kind of teetered around this topic a little bit, you know, and I think that um, my awareness of union with the divine um, dropped into me before I had that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I had oriented myself towards spiritual practice and as I've been trying to live as a sort of modern monk, you know, yep. for, for these years. And so whenever that came into, as a, a invitation, um, the friend that I, I, I did that with, he said, dude, it's just going to just like put you in 3d for what you're already seeing in color basically mm. you know mm -hmm. and i was like okay cool and he wasn't wrong i was like holy shit i'm in a cartoon you know so <laughs> but uh it's so simon you know and um but there was some deep healing that happened there and i bring that up because well we've kind of circled around it but for some people that might be the thing that that gets them out of their head because we idolize that yeah. so much yep mm -hmm. um and for other people it might, because they're in their head so much and because they're so neurotic about things, it might not be the best thing mm. at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But it comes back down to the intuition. And I believe in a spiritual dimension that's always inviting you. And so it's not really that you get to some destination. It's what's the next right step for you. Mm. And only the individual knows that. Mm -hmm. What's the next right step for them? Yeah. I can invite people, provide passage, invite them on a path. Only they take steps, you know, and I only want to be there to support in the next right step. So mm. meditation, uh, begin to drop out of the mind and into the heart, into the emotions. And some of these things might help you do that. Um, and then I would also just say too, like, I think if you can just begin to look at your life as a beautiful narrative of the divine living a life through you. Uh, it's not my will, but yours be done. Like if, if yep. you become a vessel, become an instrument yep. for, uh, you know, in Hinduism, you, you want to be the flute that Krishna blows through, you know, mm -hmm. to create the song. Like I want to be the instrument. So my job is just to stay in tune. You know, I play music. So like my job is to tune the guitar and allow a song to be played mm. so if people could see their life more artistically creatively you know um not as lost in their own neurosis um i think it would help people find the spirit a little easier yeah you know? yeah so yep i am but a servant <laughs> yes dude very well said again um yeah i mean that was good i just gotta sit and take that one in <laughs> well said <laughs> You're too kind, man. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, intuition leads the way. Intuition is like a higher form of wisdom or intelligence that when you tap into it, will just lead you in however 
uh, the orchestra of your life, the symphony of your life wants to be played out. You know, you just sort of surrender to it. You could even say that is God in a way, right? To use the G Mm -hmm. word, that is you tapping in with God. That's the Holy Spirit. I see intuition in the Holy Spirit as almost synonymous terms. And yeah, once you tap into that, it's like superpowers come about, it seems. And you can take that into all facets of life. Everything from literally playing an instrument to doing the dishes to driving a car to doing a podcast, anything. This intuition, this heart intelligence is superior, it seems, to the mind. And the mind doesn't go away, but it becomes the master, right? The heart becomes the master. The mind is what serves the heart. And yeah, man, that's like, that's the big switch. That's the big difference that comes from this Mm -hmm. gnosis. Because we can talk about self-realization and seeing and yada, yada, feeling the divine. But then it's like, okay, yeah, then the show goes on. What's this all about after you? realize these things after you have these revelations done what's this really all about then well it's about yeah. becoming a loving servant pretty much become a little more, more compassionate become a little bit better person to yourself and the others around you right it's creating the kingdom of heaven without you found it within but now next step is creating it without once you yes dude. This. and uh yeah that's where i think this all alludes to would you agree is that like once you feel it once you see it once you have the spirit dawn in you that uh, what comes forth from it is just a loving presence and expression that is, uh, that's it. Yeah. Is that what comes forth from it? Just a loving expression in the human form? Yes. Yeah. It changes everything. Like even said, like doing the dishes, driving the car, like the way you treat people. And, and it shows that it doesn't matter Eastern, Western world. It shows that we have not really taken spirituality very sincerely yeah. because it's not permeated our life. Yeah. You know, that word God actually means to pour when you trace it back to the Greek. Really? It just, it's, it's a, it's a term that then came into Europe that actually means to call or to invoke. And it was used in a spiritual setting in a ritual setting to invoke the spiritual realm. And so when you're, you are tapping into God, we aren't, if it means to pour, it's to pour into us, Mm -hmm. the divinity, Mm -hmm. but overflow into us, into all of our world. And so it's quite obvious that we've not taken sincerely the pouring of divinity into ourselves into the world around us, or else we would not be in the situation we're in right now, would we? <laughs> yeah. It would look so I different. think that, right. And so I think that uh, to your point, the evidence has to be there. Like Jesus talks about the, uh, here I am like referencing that, right? Like, you know, you'll know a tree by its fruit. And I think, In another place, he's talking to the religious people. He's like, you didn't visit me in prison. You didn't clothe me whenever I was naked. You didn't bring me food when I was hungry. And they're like, what do you mean? We never saw you like any of this. He says, if you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. Point being is your awakening is so that you would become that servant to the world. And, um, you know, I love uh, even like Ram Dass talks about if you think you're enlightened to go spend a couple weeks with your family. Mm Mm-hmm. And the world becomes then the sandpaper to bring the formation to who you think you've become. Yeah. Because when you're a monk in the woods somewhere, you have no contrast to put that up against, Mm. to see truth coming back mirrored to you Mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. And so to be in the world, you know, like if I have a, frustrating thing you know with my wife or my kid's teacher or a client i'm working with or whatever or a disgruntled person at the church that thinks i'm a heretic or whatever like all of those things are only showing me the areas of refinement and that's what the incarnation is Mm. the incarnation in the human form is the soul's refinement that's what we're here for yeah and so i want to come out of this body one day whenever that should be and say, the responsibility I had in this incarnation uh, was accomplished. Mm -hmm. And the only way I think people can do that is, at least for me, I guess, who might say for anybody else, for me, it's to create that within me, but exactly like you're saying, the kingdom without as well. Mm -hmm. How is all of these things providing opportunities for inner refinement, but also invitation for another person to have a change of mind Mm -hmm. as well. 
and to serve another person. That's why I use the word minister instead of pastor, because the word minister means servant. Uh, I think pastors convoluted and, you know, you got like preachers and sneakers and all these people like just worried about drip instead of actually like serving the community. Yeah. And it's like, I have this idea for a book called servant, not CEO, <laughs> because I don't think that churches are supposed to be businesses. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're temple spaces mm. for service. Um, anyways, tangent there, but I do think that you're right. Like the evidence of a sincere spirituality always comes out in selfless service to do what must be done in the incarnation. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man. Very well said. And, uh, it's quite simple in that way, right? It's quite simple. Once you realize that the incarnation is about, it seems to be learning servitude, learning compassion through the world, not despite the world, through mm -hmm. all of the circumstances and situations and karma that we reap. It's learning that it's being in the world and not of it, right? Yes. Yeah. I think that's the sadhana. It's like, how do we dance with the world and transmutate the energy to serve no matter what, no matter how, what, um, how do I put this? No matter what life throws at you, there's countless tests, right? Like you said, Maybe, you know, someone thinks you're a heretic, a bad comment on YouTube, somebody cut you off in traffic, whatever it is, it's countless tests, but it's like, how do you stay grounded and rooted in the Holy Spirit amidst that? I think that's what this whole mm -hmm. thing is about, right? It's like, that's the whole test that Jesus and all of the other sages were alluding to. It's that this resonance um, the kingdom of heaven, this realization is not like, it's not another world. You're still in the material world, the illusion of Maya. But you're like, in a way, creating a new world as you go by responding differently to how this world presents itself to you. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. it's weird. It is like you reach this realization within. And there's naturally it flows without if you are in tune enough. And that does create a new world. It's like, that's just how it has to be. You can't just keep this all to yourself, right? It's kind of why I do the exactly. podcast, right? And you probably can attest to your creations as well. It's like, it just wants to flow out. This new world from this essence just wants to naturally and effortlessly flow out to create something new. It's right. It's like a new stage in our evolution, it seems. But really... Mm -hmm. I don't think it's anything new. I think we're just remembering who we really are, <laughs> right? Dude, well said. Yes, that's it. We're just coming back to our roots. We're, we're really coming back to what it really means to be a human being. We've been lost in the darkness for so long, susceptible by the powers that be. Who knows? Lucifer. We've been susceptible in some way, just off our rocker, you could say. But we're coming back home. We're coming back to the true meaning of what it means to be a human being. And we do that all in our own way, all in our own circumstances, in our own karma. We reap it in our own way and we create this new world as we go. Truly, I think it's happening, man. I really think it's yeah. happening. We're creating this new world in all of our own circumstances and situations. I feel it. You know, I feel something's yeah. going on. It's like this pull. It's this pull toward, uh, I don't know if it's utopia, but it's a pull toward just betterment because it's like, mm -hmm. why not? And what else is there to do? <laughs> <laughs> right, right right i can't think of a better thing to to orient my life around yeah you know yeah exactly it's like how how can you not and this, the show still goes on we still got to do the dishes and you know take your kids to soccer practice or whatever and the bs the drama it still happens you still got to do the stuff of the humanly um condition right i get that doesn't negate any of that it's just like different there is a higher pursuit and purpose that is almost on top of that right it's almost mm -hmm. like it's not superior to any of the humanly stuff it actually makes you a better servant in all your humanly stuff you might do the dishes really good with the holy spirit right there you go you might be more in tune and more present with other people and sit down and listen to them and love them and you remember to hold the door for somebody or you tip the homeless guy or just like in the little moments that's where it really shines through man but point of the story is um 
we're creating something new from this wavelength, right? You create it within mm -hmm. first, and then it just naturally flows without. That's the point. And you know when you're in the presence of that, you know? Yeah, very and Like, true. even in our conversation, like, you know when you are in resonance with that. And uh, I think one of the greatest things that you can do is the people that everyone has a divine spark within them, you know? And true. what we're doing is, is just the match that's been lit in us is trying to touch it, yep. you know, like and all these others. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and I just think that like, <laughs> it's not always received, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's those moments that you never know when that, that flame is going to take light, you know? Yeah. Some people do it for yeah. me. Yeah. I'm not perfect. It, Sometimes somebody just, they're present. They're doing them. They're the Buddha, right? They're Buddha on the sidewalk and they just light me up and I'm like, oh, I forgot again. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Cause we do forget in, in the illusion because yeah. we, we are in the wheel of samsara, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it is tricky, you know, we forget all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why we need each other. And I it's talking about God is to pour. And so I'm always, the prayer is to pour divinity in and through my life and then to give that to others. But also sometimes I don't feel like I can do that for myself. I'm empty. I forget. And I don't mean like the 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 good kind of Buddhist em emptiness, you know. I, I mean like I feel despairing, you know. Yeah. I deal with self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Like I I have all of the things that I get lost in, my melodrama, and I need people to pour that divinity into me, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do together. And I feel like that's exactly what you're saying is like you go out and you begin to to be the pouring, which is literally to be God then yeah, in people's lives. Yeah. You know, and not in the kingly sense of like the guy in control. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's, people think God, I know you probably don't, but you know, many people think God, they think, oh, the guy in control on the throne. Mm -hmm. it's like, no, dude, like the, the experiential eternal presence that is, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really good, man. I love that you uh, have that approach because I've been on podcasts or had conversations with people offline or whatever, and um, it's tempting to want to get in the whole. Sorry, you kind of broke up there. Of, Can you repeat what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry about that. Um, but it's I've had these different conversations with people in spiritual circles, and. Um, I love so much what you're doing because you, what you're articulating is, is that there's something that an, an overflow where a lot of pop spirituality is about, again, coming back to just more information about concepts that are esoteric or far out, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not that that stuff's, but I like that stuff, you know? But the point isn't that only, yeah, you know? Mm hmm. Uh, and whenever I see people like you who are doing something that that includes them yet transcends them, that's where it's like that's that's it. That's it. That's the purpose. That's good. You know, includes and transcends simultaneously. That's good. I like that. Yeah, man. Powerful stuff. Yeah, and it really just comes down to we're helping each other remember. <laughs> Dude, Ram Dass said it best, man. We're all just walking each other home. That's it. Dude, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, I thank you for helping me walk home. Um, I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. I don't have anything else to say. Do you have anything else you want to say um, before we wrap this up? Oh, man, just thank you, Gary, for for sharing sharing an hour with me and talking. This stuff, it lights me up. And um, Same. I hope it helps helps people take a step further and reimagining this familiar figure as well. When you have a, some weird random minister on here that is talking about all these far out ideas and stuff. So <laughs> hopefully it's, it's a good thing for, for some people listening. I think so. I hope so. If not anybody else to help me. So yeah, that's why I do this, man. I come on here and hang out. And uh, I think I said it before. It helps me remember truly. It helps me remember what's real, you know, cause it's so hard to get, I mean, I'm sorry. It's so easy to get lost in the sauce, right? There's so yeah. much just illusion and distortion of really what we are. So coming on here with people that know, right? They know what's up. You know what's up. It's just like, yeah, 
right? It's just a reaffirmation. So yeah, this is very special. This is my sadhana. And I thank you for coming on here and helping my uh, sadhana along. And I thank anybody that listened this long as well. You know, you're all a part of it as well. So that's it. Peace and love to you, Luke. Um, I wish yeah. you all the best. And peace and love to the listener as well. That's it. We're all walking each other home. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Goodbye.